Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're excited that you're with us this week. We're coming at you live from Hulse Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And uh, we got a really nice show planned for you today. We're going to have some show and tell, have some tool of the week as usual. Yep. And then the main meat of today's show, we're going to talk about beans and butter beans. Peas, beans, and butter beans. That's right. And um, we're going to get into all different kind of varieties, planting strategies there. And then, as always, at the end of the show, we'll answer a few of your questions from last week's show. And um, I guess you're eating again. Yeah, well, figs are coming in now. And there's nothing I love better than figs. Everybody's got their favorite thing they like to eat. Fresh figs off the tree is my thing. I just love them. I can eat them. Now, this variety right here, let me get a little better one there. It's called, you can see it there, that's called a brown turkey fig. That's right. And that's probably the most popular variety that we see in our area here. And these things are full of sugar. It's just like eating candy. And uh, everybody's got a fig tree, as <clears throat> Norman's got this variety. However, there's some new fig trees out there, and we've talked about them before. And LSU has got some, and I rooted some this last year, and I've planted four fig trees, and I've got about three or four left over. So if there's somebody local that would like to have one of these big, fancy LSU fig trees, get with me and I might be, might be willing to share. Might be able to do something for them. Might huh? be able to do something for them. I got three or four extra ones out there and uh, I got all I pl all planted that I think I might need. Yeah, well, I've got a brown turkey at my house too that's huge and uh, we've been picking them. Uh, I don't necessarily like eating them raw as much but we like making jelly out yep. of them. Um, I tell you- Fig preserves. Fig, fig preserves. Uh, my wife's even made fig pizza before. Well, that's a new one. That's pretty. It's pretty yep. tasty. Um, I was out there picking some last night. You got to pick them before they fall on the ground for the birds get them. Uh, but you got to watch out for Wally when you're out there picking them. Wally. Wally the wasp. Wally the wasp. He'll get you. He'll get you. You yep. got to let Wally have his figs, and yep. you get your figs. So don't get in Wally's way, and. Uh, You'll be okay. You know, one thing I have found, uh, they, fruit flies are really bad to get on figs certain times. But if you keep it real clean around the bottom of them and don't let your grass grow up, the bugs, the the fruit flies and other bugs that may attack figs seem to be a lot better. So that's one thing I have picked up on. Yeah, if you keep your grass cut underneath yep. them, you won't have uh, as many problems there. I like to take a few of those that are, they get too ripe and bust on you. Take a few of those feeling the chickens. The chickens absolutely oh, yeah. love them. Yep. So uh, good uh, good time of year for picking figs. They don't last long. Nope. Pretty short window. Yep. But, uh, yep. And some of these newer varieties, not the brown tucker, but some of these newer varieties will actually set fruit twice on there. So you get to pick those twice. Yeah. I have to keep mine trimmed by every year it it gets loaded down and them old hat grabber limbs yep. you know what i'm talking the about hat grabbers yeah you have to uh, have to take them off a little bit and trim it back or else you uh now when you eat them fresh off the tree every now and then you're gonna get you one that's sour yeah you just have to push through it and get you a couple good ones to go behind it wash that sour away and just keep on plugging along but you're gonna get you a sour one every now and then you just have to go on get you a couple more cleanse yep. your palate and you're right. good to go mm -hmm. All right. Well, good deal. Hopefully everybody else has got some figs out there making some jelly. We've seen a couple posts on the Row by Row group. I know Cindy was making some fig jelly and several others. So uh, yep. it seems like it's about that time for everybody. Now, what's the what's the northern distribution on the figs? Well, you know, there's a variety called Chicago Hardy that I'm not real familiar with, but I've read on it a little bit. And I believe Stark Brothers carries it. And it can grow on up pretty north. So they have done, in the last few years, they've done some work with some varieties that are a lot more cold tolerant than they used to be. So there are varieties out there, if you'll do your research, that you can grow on a lot further north. Uh, the brown turkey and things like that, I think they probably do pretty good here in the south. If you get above Tennessee, up in there, there I'm not sure how well they would do because they will freeze sometimes. You get some damage. But here in the south, we don't have any problems whatsoever. Yeah, you ride down the road, almost every neighbor you got has one in there. Yeah, the every old homestead's got a fig tree. Yeah, yeah. All right, so good stuff with figs there. Now let's get into our tool of the week segment. And uh, this week, 
our tool of the week. So recently, I don't know how many you've talked to, but I've talked to several customers calling, wanting to know when they can plant this for fall harvest. You know, where we are in the south here, we got about a month or two where we just have to hold pat and just be patient. Then we can start planting some fall stuff because we got to wait that temperature breaks a little bit. But for some of our friends in the north, they're thinking about the fall stuff because they got a, a smaller window and they sure. they can go ahead and start planting some of this fall stuff. Yep. Um, and so a lot of people have been calling and asking when should I plant this, when should I plant that. And the perfect tool we have for that is this thing right here called a garden planner. Mm -hmm. the planner, P-L-A-N-N-E-R, not like planter. And uh, this lists about every crop you can imagine on the side here. And it's a little slide chart. You see it slides back and forth like that. And what you do is you line this red line up here. You got a, a fall side and a spring side. So for the fall side, there's dates along here. You line this red line up with your first frost date. For us, that's towards the end of November. Mm -hmm. November 20th, I believe. Um, and so you line that up there. And then for each crop, it's going to tell you when you should plant that crop and then when you could expect to be harvesting that crop. And um, really comes in handy. There's, there's row spacing information on here. There's in row spacing. There's even some companion planting suggestions on here of what to plant beside, uh, what crop to plant beside another crop. Really good stuff here. $5 free shipping. Really handy piece to have around. Yeah, and you can find your first frost date, that would be in the springtime, in your, excuse me, your first frost date in the fall, and your last frost date in the spring. And that's easily if you'll Google your area and it'll tell you that information there and you can get that information and correspond it with this right here. And this is a great little tool to keep out of the garden shed because you ain't got to have internet access when you want to look something up. That's right, that's right. Yeah, there's several websites I've seen. Some of them you have to know your plant hardiness zone. They'll tell you your first and last frost date. Some of them you put in your zip code and it gives you. Yeah. Uh, so good information to have regardless. Bunch of different, yeah. Once you know that date, it doesn't change that much. And uh, so yeah, awesome little chart here. We send out a lot of these, a lot of people like them. A lot of people buy two or three of them, give one to their neighbor and mom or whoever else likes to garden. So I'll put a link on the screen there and um, you can check that out. Yep. All right, so now we'll get into the meat of the show, our main segment, and we're gonna talk about beans, butter beans, and peas this week. And um, first of all, let's, before we get into butter beans, let's talk about just regular beans, what we call bush beans or pole beans, um, beans that we eat, usually boil them or can them, that kind of stuff. And uh, several different ways you can plant these things. And I did a video, uh, I want to say it was last year, maybe it was the year before that. And uh, I had several people since then tell me they tried it and it worked really well for them. But when growing beans, regardless of the variety, I tried this double row technique. And you're talking about bush beans. I'm talking about bush beans, not pole beans. Uh, for the bush beans, planting them on a double row, so running one line of drip, and then planting those beans on both sides, and they'll grow away from that tape there, and you can harvest from both sides, and what you end up having is twice the amount of beans in the same amount of space as one row. And uh, that drip waters them good, you can keep them fertilized, and uh, really works well, so that that's the way I've been planting the bush beans here late. I didn't grow any this year because I had enough put up from last year, but uh, thinking about growing some this fall. Well, I always grow a few bush beans every year, early in the spring. If we don't need to put up any, we eat them fresh. Bush beans, beans are easy to grow. Now you want to grow them early. You don't want to grow them late because if you start growing them late and you get in the heat in summer, you can have some problems with the blooms falling off. Beans do not like hot, hot weather. They'll throw the blooms off and they will not make. So we always plant our beans early. Beans is of course a legume, so it didn't take a lot of nitrogen for them. And it's a great crop to grow because it comes off easy, it comes off early, it doesn't take a lot of time, and it doesn't have a lot of pest problems if you grow it early in the year. Now the way we do the beans that we grow is we can them. A lot of times we will put them in with potatoes. So our potatoes will come off 
right before our green bean does, we kind of time it that way. And we take our smaller potatoes and we jar them in with our beans. And we got this right here, which is about perfect for two people. So you can open this up, you got your potatoes and your green beans all in one jar there. And you can just heat it up because they're fully cooked. Add a little meat and you're good to go. Yeah. Now let's talk about varieties a little bit. So the ones that we have found ourselves growing in the last few years have been more toward what we call the French varieties. Right, right. So we, we I've grown the the Blue Lake, which it seems to probably be the most popular. That's, yeah. that's everybody I feel like has grown that one at one point in time. Um, the Contender, which is a little bigger one. It's and, a hybrid, I believe. And uh, yep. grown that one. That has got a really big seed. And then uh, we grew one called Momentum. Mm -hmm. And yep. then there's another one out there I've yet to try, but I know a lot of the market farmers grow it called Provider. Yeah. Now these make, these yield a lot. These make a lot of beans and they are what we call the French variety. And what has happened, we've had an evolution in the way we like our beans in the last 30 years. So these are the slender varieties. A lot of people just stir fry them or they snap the ends off of them and they like to eat them that way, and they, they serve different ways of preparing them. Now, that being said, back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, the primary beans that we had around here and in most parts of the country was a flat bean. And the, the variety that comes to mind for me is Kentucky Wonder, which is a flat pole bean. And those was grown extensively around here back in the day, and still up in Appalachia, up in the mountains, and, and the old uh, mountain areas, they still grow a lot of these, and these have, these have exceptional flavor. They're different than the French style beans, but they have an exceptional flavor. And you know what I think I'm gonna do next year? I think I'm gonna go back and grow some of those. I haven't grown them in a long time. I've got stuck on these French varieties, cause we like them, but I'm gonna go back and try some of those flat beans next year, I think. Yeah, I grew, uh, I can't remember what the variety was. I'm gonna say Roma, or I don't remember the name, but a, a flatter one, uh, couple of years ago that, that worked out really well uh, with those bush beans though you, you don't want to plant too much that you can't pick them all because this with one uh, last year it was taking me one 40 foot row double row of course it would take me about 45 minutes to get out there with a stool and about twice a week picked them things and I'd have buckets of them. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot of them. Now, if you don't have a lot of room, if you got a lot of room, like what we do, I definitely grow some of these bush beans because they're easy, like we said before, they're easy to grow. But if you don't have a lot of room, you're in an urban environment, you probably want to lean towards more of these pole beans because you can make a lot more off a lot smaller area with the pole beans than you can with the bush beans. Right, because you can grow them vertically. Yep. You're not worried about your, your horizontal space there. Well, let's talk about butter beans, being where we're on that. We got butter beans, yeah. So I remember when I was a kid, we grew these uh, climbing butter beans. Yep. And we used to go get some uh, bamboo stalks and we made a little teepee and uh well those things grew and grew you, you might have to get a step ladder up there yep. to pick them yep well, i don't grow the bush butter beans anymore i quit years ago and what i grew is the climbers mm -hmm. now i do them a little bit different now than i do we used to do the teepee thing but we do it a little bit different now we put up cow panels and grow them on the cow panels i can even show a picture here of the ones we got growing this year now there's three different varieties of the climbing butter beans that I'm aware of. Now, I'm sure there's more than that out there. I'm just telling you ones that I've had experience with. They make a speckled one. The, uh, the Christmas. The Christmas tree. And also a regular green one. Now, I've grown both of those. And those are easy to get at our local feed and seed store. They carry those. Of course, you can order them too. But those are a climbing butter bean. But this one right here, let's see if you can get, we can show you a couple. Oh, oh. A couple had been growing these from Columbus, Georgia, and this is an heirloom variety that had been growing for years. And you can see it's kind of a dark purple. They sent me some of these, and these are the ones I planted this year. Now, they're green till they get mature. When they get mature, they turn that darker color there. And it's a smaller butter bean than the Christmas tree mm -hmm. or the green. But we really like these. We picked them a couple times already. And these make like a dark broth. And they're really good to eat. Uh, I probably grow them again next year. I like these because they're not quite as big as the other ones. And the great thing about these butter beans, climbing butter beans, is they're a lot easier to pick. Oh, a lot easier, a lot easier. Um, I haven't grown, last time, it was probably three or four years ago, last time I grew bush butter beans, you, you know how I picked them? Yeah. 
I pulled the wheelbarrow out there and pulled them all up and went and sat in the shade and pulled them off the bush. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, picking the bush ones either. But uh, the, the trellising ones, what I found is the one, the darker color ones, like the, the speckled, the Christmas one, or like that one, tend to have a kind of a meatier, nuttier flavor to them. Uh, they just, they taste a little more nutritious. I like the taste. They're really good in soups, the darker yeah. ones are. Whereas the, the green ones are, are more just cooked by itself, maybe with a little ham. Now what you can do with these climbing butter beans, you plant them in the springtime, and you're gonna get two or three pickings off of them, then it's gonna turn hot. And it's gonna probably get a little dry on them. Of course, we got drip irrigation underneath ours. But it's gonna get really hot. And they're gonna look kind of rough for a while. They're gonna quit making. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I spray them with a the fungicide, and I spray them a couple times on the set side, and them things will bounce back, and you can pick them all the way till frost. Yeah, I, I typically don't plant mine so they run the whole year. I usually plant them in the fall. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll reuse a trellis that I use for something else in the spring. And so, you know, when you put up those cow panels for your cucumbers or maybe you have some English peas or something, you know, don't just put it up one time and take it down. Reuse that thing several times so you get more... Uh, crop out of your effort of putting it up yep. and so I'll take what I'm going to do this year once the temperature breaks a little bit I'm probably going to plant some pole beans where I had my cucumbers on that cow panel um, another thing I've seen people do is leave the corn stalks up yep. and uh, use the old corn stalks if you got some field corn out there nice you know heavy stalks uh, once those dry those have become pretty tough you can use those as a trellis you could even, and you did this with some English peas this past year, you could even take your Florida weave from your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Just pull your tomatoes up, leave the weave there, mm -hmm. and uh, use that as a trellis. So you don't have to install a new trellis, kind of be resourceful and uh, use what you already got put in the garden. Yeah, so on the, let's talk about the bush beans, excuse me, the pole beans just a little bit more. So the Heirloom varieties, the old varieties, the standbys that's been out there forever that really have good taste to them that has kind of fallen by the wayside. Let's talk about that. So we got Kentucky Wonder. That's probably the most popular one. You got another one called Rattlesnake? Yes, the Rattlesnake pole beans are the, the kind of speckled ones. Uh, you'll see some companies call them, uh, they make one called Dragon Tongue that kind of looks similar, but Rattlesnake ones are popular. The seeds kind of speckled and the pods on those are kind of speckled. I don't know how well those do for preserving versus fresh eating. Uh, I've never seen anybody put those up. But, uh, and there's a blue lake pole bean out there too. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's not as flat. It's more rounder than the, so if you don't like the flat beans, but you still want to grow some pole beans, that blue lake is a good one, been around a long time. It might be the one for you to go with. I personally am going to try some of the Kentucky Wonders again next year. Yeah, that's, I think that's what I'm going with this fall is the Kentucky yep. Wonder. Now, I have, several years ago, I tried this unusual variety from Baker Creek called Chinese Noodle Bean. And these things would get like this long. Now, they weren't good for putting up. They were really good for eating fresh, like stir fry. You didn't really want to boil them, but if you cook them on a pan or cook them in the oven, they were really good. And, and one, you know, it don't take many of them that long to, to feed a bunch of people. They were, uh, they would grow like crazy. They would double, triple in size every day. So that was Yeah, there's some varieties out of the old timers. You may hear them talk about string beans and they're referring to some of the pole beans. Back in the day, a lot of the older varieties would have a fiber string in them. So when you snap them, they kind of run down through there. Now the Kentucky Wonder, some of the new ones, most of them, that has been bred out of them. So uh, you don't hear about that as much anymore. You don't have those that in your varieties as much anymore as what you used to. And I'm not a big fan, fan of those varieties. The Kentucky Wonder is stringless. So that's probably that or the rattlesnake is one I'm gonna go with. Yeah, and the, we can't grow the uh, the dry beans down here, no. like the kidney beans, the white beans. I love to eat them, but uh, disease and uh, insect, the curcurio and all that is... Uh, yeah, our environment is not conducive to growing those. I wish we could because that is a great food source. Stores well. To store well, and you know, this country has been fed off beans for years, so that is a great thing to have, and you're, you know, you can dry them. You ain't got to have... Uh, 
refrigeration anything to keep them just keep it dry beans soak it when you get ready to use it cook it and i am envious of those people that can that can grow those and put those up yeah i really like those dried white lima beans yep put them in a crock pot with some yep. ham those are absolutely delicious and then one more thing on the butter beans that's kind of a, a staple down here a variety of bush butter beans people grow what was called the ford hook variety yep and they're huge yep. they're big it's one of the only thing the only vegetables you really it's hard to plant with our garden cedar because the, the seed's so big that it won't fit through the tube the seed can be over a you know, close to an inch wide. Yeah, I seem to have trouble with germination on those. So if you're going to plant them, you need to plant them thick because the germination on them is off a little bit on them. A lot of the older folks like those. They they don't make a, they usually just make two beans per pod, but they're, they're really huge. big. Yeah. They're really big. Uh, anytime you're planting beans, especially with the cedar, because man, you, you between one variety to the next, your seed size is going to vary greatly. So always make sure you, uh, check that hole size and drill those out before you get out there plant save you a lot of trouble and I'll make sure you get a good stand. Yeah, I don't know if we cover this or not, but beans is self-pollinators, so you don't have to have bees. They pollinate on their own. So uh, that's one good thing you don't have to worry about. We're tomatoes and cucumbers and other things. We always worry about pollination, squash and all that. We worry about pollination and that's not necessarily a concern with, uh, with beans. Right, you don't need pollinators. Uh, you do need to be proactive if you know you're going to have some insect problems on them. Start spraying early if you yeah. see uh, The curio is not as bad on beans as it is on peas, our southern peas that we try to grow, but they will attack them, we'll sting them. So I always stay after them with some neem oil and I'll rotate maybe some pyrethrin in there. Neem probably works the best for me early in the season for the curio, so I will stay after them with that. When they start blooming is when I start spraying. Right, right. All right, so hopefully uh, some of you guys are getting ready to plant a fall crop of beans, and we're envious, and we'll be right behind you in a couple months. Yep. We'll be planting our beans, and the uh, nice thing about planting fall beans is it's nice and cool out there when you harvest them, and uh, fall time of year, a little crisp in the air feels good. Yeah. All right, so let's get into our customer uh, questions, or excuse me, our, our, our questions from our video last week. Um, and this week, instead of giving away a koozie, what we're gonna give away is one of these garden planters wow. here. Okay, so if we answer your question next week, or if we've answered your question this week, send us a email to cussserve at hostools.com and uh, with your address, and we'll get you one of these fancy little garden planters in the mail. So let's get to our questions here. And our first question is from Stuck Nars. And Stuck says, what can I do to make my onions grow? He's been growing in horse compost, tried some beds, rows, 20 inch pots, uh, lives in Southeast Georgia, it's not too far from us. And uh, said he just can't get those big, beautiful onions. He's kind of frustrated about it. Yeah, well onions take a lot more nitrogen than you may have thought. Onions take a lot of moisture. You gotta keep water and they take a good bit of nitrogen. Horse manure is great. It's got a lot of benefits to it. It's got a lot of uh, organic matter in it. But it's not very high in nitrogen. So my first thought is there that he's going to have to supplement that with some nitrogen source. Now, I have gotten better over the last few years growing onions. And one thing that I have found that I wouldn't fertilize them enough early on. So I've started fertilizing, keeping the nitrogen to them, keeping a good all-around fertilizer to them more, and I get a big, lot nicer, not healthier onion. So my answer to stuff would be to hit it more with some fertilizer. Continue to use the compost, the manures, because they're great. They have a lot of benefits there, but you're going to have to supplement that with a nitrogen source probably. Yeah, usually anytime you see people having problems with onions, it's not enough water, not enough nitrogen. Now, you do yours a little different, but I plant mine on the double rows on drip tape. And what I, once those onions get out of their kind of transplant shock stage and they really start, the leaves start making several nights there where I'll let my water run all night. Mm -hmm. And it a, a day later, those onions have soaked up all that water. Yeah. It, the, it, you don't realize it because you don't see the dividends until the bulbing stage, but really feeding those plants during the leaf production stage is going to, is going to help out when they start bulbing. And I would, I would, you know, if you can get your hands on some chicken manure, oh yeah, uh, that's going to give you a lot more nitrogen. And then 
if if you've got a way to do it, inject that some of that 20, 20, 20, I'd say once a week. And, uh, or you really just have to grind your fertilizer, 10, 10, 10, whatever you get your hands on. You just need to feed those onions pretty regularly. And I just don't think onions are, are good to grow in a pot. I think they're more uh, suitable for growing in the ground. On the flat is what we say. But I, I, I don't think you're going to be very successful, and I don't think you're going to reap a lot of dividends for trying to grow onions in pots. Well, any a, a pot or a, a, a structural raised bed, anything like that, that's going to dry out a lot quicker than mm -hmm. the ground is. And with onions needing so much moisture, I just don't think in a situation like that you're going to be able to give them enough water yep. as you would be in the ground. Right. You know, even if you get a hard rain, that that raised bed, that pot's going to dry out pretty quick, whereas yep. that ground holds some so moisture. So try growing grow them in the flat ground there, try and put a little more fertilizer to them. Pay attention to your water. Anytime those tops start browning a little bit or they don't look as green or growing as you think they should, it's probably because of water or fertilizer. All right. So send us, uh, Stuck, send us your address and we'll get you one of the garden planters on the way. And then our second question here is from Lewis, or maybe it's Louis, Lewis G. And uh, he says here's us talking a lot about drip tape. He wants to know how he can reuse it for more than one season and is there any tricks to pulling it up? So, for most crops, you, all you have to do really is go to the end of that row, grab that tape, and walk it back. You're going to yank it right up. You'll yank your crops up too, which is, it helps you clean up that area. The only thing, the only crop that is a little difficult to pull it up with can be corn. Yep. Or if you had your sunflowers on drips, sunflowers could be another one that could be problematic. Both of those have a very fibrous root system though. So what we do is we'll cut that stalk off while it's green. I found it's easier to cut when it's oh, green. Yeah. So we'll cut that stalk off, let that stalk dry down, let it start um, decomposing. And then I'll wait probably a couple months and then you can go in there and grab it and it'll pop up. Right. Or the other option is, is to use this as an opportunity to reuse the drip tape right where it is. So what I would do, and, and this is kind of what you did with yours, when your corn's done, once you're done picking it, assuming this is sweet corn, you're done picking your corn while those stalks are still green, like you said, come through there with a machete, cut those stalks down, leave your drip tape still right there, come in there and plant something that's going to provide some ground cover. <clears throat> sweet potatoes would be great. Uh, pumpkins, which is what you did. Mm-hmm. Those, those stalks that are you know cut off, they're not getting in the way of those pumpkin or sweet potatoes, right. uh, and they'll they'll biodegrade. And meanwhile, you're reusing that tape, reusing that crop. So, yeah, and actually, I just did this. So, with my sweet corn, my ambrosia got through. The day after I got through pulling it, I go through there and chop it down. And I went back in there and planted Seminole pumpkins right there on my drip tape. So I'm gonna get two crops off from that drip tape with not a lot of effort. Right, right. You don't have to relay it. Yep. And it, cutting down those stalks takes no time. So think ahead on that, kind of like we talked about reusing the trellises earlier. Reuse your drip tape where they and think about crops. You can come in behind it, low maintenance crops yep. that you can plant uh, where you cut down that corn. All right, so that's going to do it for this week. Uh, we've got to get back at it here and uh, start shipping out some more garden tools, and we will see you guys next week. See you later.